So uh, I'd like to thank the speakers for, for perhaps foolishly asking me to get the first talk in this workshop. Uh, I hope they won't regret it. So uh, you may be familiar with me from other contexts, like uh, the dynamic recurrent neural networks, theories of sleep, right? The big hit, why we hear funny sounds in our ears. But what I'm going to talk about today is automatic differentiation. And automatic differentiation is a is as old as anything in computer science. So I'm going to start by looking at old guys. So we're all familiar with, with, with this guy. He used to dominate this conference, right? This is Markov. So uh, oh, I'm sorry. It, um, of course, of course. Is 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 there a um, is there some question? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. If, 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 I, if I stray, like point at me and I'll remember. <laughs> Thanks. So there's a lot of math related to probability theory in machine learning. But I want to talk about some other gentlemen that I, I think maybe are, are gaining increasing importance in this community. Again, so you all recognize these three people, right? That's uh, Andre Ivan over there, um, Alexander, do topology stuff, so you can forget about that, and Kamagra, of course. So uh, all of our work on regularization, right? That's basically trying to like what Kamagra told told us what the right thing to do is, but it's uncomputable. So we, we do basically the whole field is trying to do computable stuff that uh, that he showed uh, exists. But who is this Pantriagin guy? So Pantriagin was a blind Russian mathematician, and he invented something called the Pantriagin maximum method, which is backpropagation. So, so let me let me give a, a, a sort of revisionist kind of history that, that tr tries to put this on some kind of unified framework and um, maybe give you something to take home. So the very first computer science PhD introduced a technique that we would now call forward mode, uh, forward accumulation mode automatic differentiation. Uh, which is, people are probably f a little familiar with that in this community, but, 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 but let me describe it. So this was Wangert in 1964. And here's his thesis. Um, this, this is his abstract, right? A procedure for automatic evaluation of total or partial derivatives of arbitrary functions is presented. Now, this was, he actually did the work in the 50s before there existed compilers or probably even assemblers, so he did it at the machine language level. But what he did was he, he, he noted that any computer program, any numeric computer program, you could basically decompose its operation from the input numbers to the output numbers into those numbers flowing through a series of, uh, of elementary functions. And if you look at those elementary functions, you know their derivatives, and by, by decomposing things, you can compute the derivatives of that whole thing. And he wrote a computer program that automatically processed another computer program to augment it with this capability. Now, somebody whose name you've probably heard of, Bellman, thought that this was really cool. Now remember, that, that was in late 1963. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so, so, so Bellman, in, in a year later, but was less than a year later, was like right on top of this. So he wrote a, a, a paper, Wingert's numerical method for blah blah blah. Right. So he thought it was pretty cool, and he said it appears uh, permits treatment of large systems of differential equations which might not otherwise be undertaken. That's still what we want. Right? We want to be able to calculate derivatives of large systems that would otherwise be difficult. So let me give you a crash course in how it actually works and, and put some notation on this. So the idea is to mechanically calculate derivatives of functions expressed as computer programs. So in Calculus 101, you learn how to calculate derivatives of functions expressed as expressions. Here, we're, we're generalizing that to computer programs. I'm not going to worry about issues of differentiability. If you try to take the derivative of a function at a place where it's not differentiable, I'm sorry. Not my problem. We are only interested in correct derivatives at places where it's differential. Okay. So let me introduce a little notation here. Consider the derivative of some function 
um, represented as a computer program, f. It's from n-dimensional vectors to n-dimensional vectors. And you can consider the Jacobian matrix, which is the, part, the matrix of partial derivatives of each input with respect to each output. In general, let's think about n and m as both being pretty huge, like a million. So that means that, that, that j is a million by million matrix. Nobody's going to be storing that. <coughs> There's two most important modes of automatic differentiation, although there are others. One is called forward mode, and that calculates the product of this Jacobian with an arbitrary vector of your choice v, and it does so with a small constant vector overhead in both time and space, and I'll show how this works in a minute. The other is called reverse mode. That's the same as backpropagation, and that calculates the Jacobian transpose times a vector v. Now notice that if m is equal to 1, and v, then v is just a one-dimensional vector, and so just slap the number 1 in it, then j transpose v is the same as the, the gradient. So that's a, a slight generalization of that propagation, I suppose. And there's, there's a zillion other modes. There's the, the zeitgeist of that community is kind of big iron, valid-age implementations. They like Fortran, but they have implementations in all different languages. It's a vibrant community. You know, they, they know Python. They're, they have a, a lot of systems. They have regular workshops. They have a very large conference with maybe 70 or 80 people every four years, like clockwork. Right? Okay. Let me distinguish now. I think the terminology gets a little confused. So I'm going to distinguish type 1, type 2, and type 3. Type 1 is knowing, if I give you a set of equations, how to transform that to make a new set of equations that calculate the derivatives of what those original equations sort of implicitly calculated. And type 1 is for really smart people. Okay, who, who can, who just think at the equation level and don't think about computational implications. That's like mathematical, like um, mathematical physicists working about adjoint systems. Type two is similar. It's, it's a mechanical way of transforming a computer program into another one that efficiently calculates derivatives, but done manually. And that's what people used to mean by backpropagation. So that's so it's a mechanical calculus for doing that, but it's not actually mechanized. People are doing it. And type three is what the AD community is mainly interested in. And that's where you have a computer program that does this transformation. So when you're talking about who invented what, you kind of have to distinguish between these things. I'm going to be talking about type three. So what's the important bit in forward AD? Let me do derive it. Consider a truncated Taylor, Taylor series expansion of this function f. So you should be thinking that at, so x here could, could be scalar, but I'll keep the notation the same if x happens to be a vector. So this will work out if x happens to be a vector, or maybe something more complicated. So there's a truncated Taylor series, and I can just change, um, well, so I don't like it because it's not symmetric, so I'm going to try to make it more symmetric. So my first step is I'm going to, I say, okay, this equation isn't symmetric, so it's hard to transform computer programs with that, that equation. Because what I want to do is take some bit of the computer program, match the left, and then kind of transform it to the right. And I want to do that and keep it as a computer program. So I want to make this equation more symmetric. So the first thing I'll do is, I, I notice that the equation doesn't have a coefficient on the epsilon on the left, but it does on the right, so I'll put a coefficient on the epsilon on the left. And that's a little more symmetric. And then I, I notice that it, it doesn't have an order epsilon squared on the left, so I'll put an order epsilon squared on the left. And now I like this equation because it's symmetric. Right? It's got this, this value flowing into f on, on the left, which is a truncated Taylor series. And it's got an, an output, which is a truncated Taylor series. So now I'll just introduce notation for that truncated Taylor series. I use x triangle x harpoon for that, that particular pair of numbers, that x, x harpoon together, that, it, uh, that represents the Taylor series. And you should think of it as sitting in computer memory, like a complex number. In fact, it's called a dual number, which goes back to so, so here's the important equation for forward mode AD. This is like the, the, the key to forward mode AD. Now let's think about the types here a little bit. So if you, if you do any programming language theory, you know that 
when somebody says, like, let's think about the types, that, that's like a politician saying, let's think about the children, right? Like, nobody would say, let's not. Right? <clears throat> so if f is from reals to reals, then this all works out. The, the x and x harpoon and f of x are, are all reals, but this is a, a dual number, which I'll denote that way. And so this equation just doesn't type check, right? Because f is supposed to take a real, and here it's getting a dual. So what we need is some operator that'll lift f from the domain of reals to the domain of duals. And we call that operator forward j. This is non-standard notation, but it's really good notation. You should copy it for sure. So here we have our equation that if you want to take some function f and transform it, this is the forward AD transformation operator, j forward. This is how it transforms. So this tells you two things. This is like a multifaceted key to forward automatic differentiation. It tells you what to do if f is a primitive operator inside your programming language. So if you're transforming a big program, and this J is going to sort of descend inside of it, transforming all of the statements, transforming everything in your computer program. You get down to F being a little primitive operator, and then it tells you how that primitive operator gets lifted from the domain of reals to the domain of dual numbers. And that F prime there is the Jacobian of that. But if F is, is little, then the Jacobian is little, like a two by one matrix or a one by two matrix or something like that. Maybe two by two if you have a primitive operator that takes two inputs and has two outputs. I don't know. Okay. But, but everything else, they're, 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 they're all really tiny. But it also tells you what will happen if you transform the whole program, which is that it'll give you both the output of the original program, f of x, and this Jacobian vector product. This, f, this j forward is compositional, which means basically that it's pretty easy to implement. It sort of runs down through your computer because you'll note that the transformation of a composition f composed with g is equal to the, the transform of f composed with the transform of g. And by making that equation symmetric, we allowed this to happen. That, that, that was the big reason for doing that. Let me give an example. So let's say we have a whole computer program. But that's a very small computer program, right? The input is u, the output is v. If we transform it, we get this. And that transform of J there is something that you look up in a table because that's a primitive operator. And those, so this is like lifting your program to work on complex numbers instead of instead of reals. But if you wanted it to be fast, you'd want to look. You'd, you'd want to kind of destructure this so you unpack that um, that that uh, V harpoon thing, and you, 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 it, would, it would expand up like this, and would turn into something like that. So you would, you would put separate variables for those so that your compiler would be, would be happy about doing that. And that's how fast implementations work. Okay, let me show how this works now. Data flow graph may be another way of thinking about it, which is there's a little Jacobian associated with every primitive operation. So you should think of this as a great big computer program, but I'm just showing a little window of it. Or you can think of it as a small computer program. It's got three inputs, three outputs. And each, each of those has a little Jacobian. That we add these additional input values and these additional output values. And now I'm going to skip ahead and tell you about reverse automatic differentiation. Now, reverse automatic differentiation is more, uh, I think, of a lot more interest to this community because it's good for calculating gradients. Forward automatic differentiation is good for calculating one element of the gradient. Not so useful, right, at a time. To calculate the whole thing, that's what we generally want. But, but Ford's also useful, like for doing Hessian vector products and things like that. It's, 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 not, it's, not so, it's something that definitely people should know about. Um, but the people in this community always say that back propagation was discovered multiple times. And it's, it, that's true even in the AD community. Reverse mode automatic differentiation was discovered many times. But I think the first person who, and, and, and okay, let me, let me distinguish these, these three types. I'm going to add a fourth type of implementation there, like type four. And that's where, what I mean by this type four is that the language of computer programs that you can transform automatically, mechanically, itself includes these differentiate these derivative taking operators inside of it. So that's like a kind of closure property. 
And that's something that I think this community really is needing right now for writing algorithms um, fluidly like um, adversarial networks, right? That, the, 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 those involve nested optimization. Or there's, it comes up all over the place where you'd like to do end-to-end -end optimization or something that inside of it is doing optimization or inside of it is calculating gradients or ray tracing and bouncing things off of surfaces and you'd like to calculate surface normals uh, automatically and stuff like that. So what we're, what, so Jeff Sisk and I embarked on a sustained project to try to develop efficient type 4 implementations. But the first person to do a type 3 implementation of reverse mode automatic differentiation, I think, was a guy named Bert Spiel Penny. And this was his PhD thesis, 1980. And here's his picture of how it works. You get a Fortran program, you feed it into his program, Jake, and you get a bigger Fortran program that calculates gradients. And he said a full solution to the problem of compiling fast gradients has been obtained. Right? It's very nice. It's great. He said something deep, a little deeper in his thesis. He said something very interesting, which is the separation of numerical analysis from software is virtually complete. Few people care to bridge the gap. In numeric analysis, the notion of programs that produce programs rather than numbers is largely absent. Right? People involved in writing software tools have a tendency to write only such software tools that aid in the writing of other software tools, like Haskell. What seems required is efforts by people with understanding of both basically compiler theory and numerics and machine learning. So, yeah, I think, I think that's really true. I think more and more machine learning is seeing the need for, for people who can, who can bridge that gap and make systems that, um, that are, are good as programming languages, meaning they're efficient and ex very efficient, very expressive, do what you want, robust, correct but serve the needs of this community. Now, let me give a little digression to, to tell you what, what reverse mode actually actually is. So I'm going to give it, so you, everybody here, of course, knows what, what back propagation is. So I'm going to try to give you a slightly different perspective on it. <coughs> I'm going to show you a very deep relation between forward mode and reverse mode. So let me do a little bit of a digression here, which is um, into uh, differential geometry. So let's con consider that function f to be mapping from this ball to this donut, the surface of the ball to the surface of the donut. Now, what does it mean to take a derivative of a function like that? Well, the way you think about that in differential geometry is you think of a space of perturbations, sitting, which is called a tangent space, sitting at each point on either the ball or the donut. And then a differentiable function maps a perturbation on the inputs into a perturbation on the output. That's what forward mode automatic differentiation does if you generalize it from, from reals to other spaces. That, um, right? That's very natural because if, if, if that input space is just a real number, then that tangent space is also a real number. And so a dual number is packaging together a point on that space and it's uh, an element of its tangent space, but if the input space is more complicated, like a function space, for example, then you have to start thinking about these issues, th th thinking about it this way. And for reasons of time, I won't talk about function spaces in any detail, but I just want to mention they're really important for, for getting this stuff to, to work out in a nice, expressive way. Like if you want to use things like map reduce inside your program, well, then you're going to have to be taking the derivative of the map function and its input at, like the function that you're mapping is going to have to get lifted into some kind of differential algebraic domain where it's got its tangent vector, which because because f is right, that function that's being mapped that lives in a function space, then its then its tangent space is, is is a complicated Hilbert space or something like that. And you actually have to work these issues out, and that's been I think the primary difficulty of getting this stuff really worked out. That's why it's taken us a really long time. So now let me tell you something called the cotangent space. So the cotangent space, it's dual to the tangent spaces. So it's linear, the space of linear mappings from perturbations to reals. Now what's a linear mapping of, well, okay, if you think of the, so the tangent space, it's just a vector space. So the things living in it are perturbations of a point, they're just vectors. And mappings of ve linear, the space of linear mappings from vectors to reals, that's just another vector. You dot product them together, right? So the cotangent space in a finite dimensional vector space has the same shape as the tangent space, right? So, so um, 
Okay. But in the function space, it makes a difference. Now, here's the relationship between forward mode and reverse mode. This is the deep relationship. So the cotangents are the things that you back propagate. The tangents are the things that we showed before that we forward propagate, those perturbations. And the relationship is, if you have a function f that goes from a to b, or from the space alpha to the space beta, so it maps a to b, then you can see Sensitivity of B to a sensitivity of A. So this is the forward pass of that propagation, and this is the reverse pass. So the, the reverse pass is being, being stashed. So this function F here represents all the saved values from the forward pass and the, the other saved structures that you need to do the, the backward pass. And the relationship is this between forward and reverse mode. That if you have a perturbation of the input and you run it through forward mode, you get a perturbation of the output. If you have a sensitivity of the output, which is like a general effort of gradient of something with respect to the output, and you run in reverse mode to get the gradient of that thing with respect to the input of, of that, then this dot product and that dot product should be equal. So let me tell you one thing. Forward mode is a heck of a lot easier to implement than reverse mode. If you want to debug reverse mode, a really good way of doing that is to implement forward mode, and then you can check this. That's a lot easier than doing divided differences and, 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 and then, and then like checking if it's within numeric fuzz of the right answer. Let me show this as a data flow graph. So here's a, a flow graph. Here's the Jacobians there, the, the little Jacobians of the, uh, of, of the primitive operations. Here's the forward mode transform. Here's reverse mode. So look, so their arrow's the same, but they went backwards. And we can put them all together, and the fancy relationship I just said is, so these green ones are flowing forwards, these red ones are flowing backwards. If you start with some green ones and some red ones, then the, the sum of the, the products here should be equal to the sum of the products here. And you can see why that's the case, because on the way forward, the green ones have the Jacobians multiplied into them, and the red ones don't. So over here, the Jacobian goes into it once, and over here, the green ones don't have the Jacobians multiplied into them yet, but the red ones do, so the Jacobian's getting there once. All right, now, in the interest of time, I'm going to um, switch forward a little bit, whoops. When you, when you generalize this, you do all this fancy work. There, all the types are manifolds, and there, there's all kinds of fancy lambda calculus and stuff that we don't completely have published yet. Um, the primary difficulty with reverse mode, as you all know, is fan out. And you can imagine compilers have a hard time with, with fan out because generally compilers aren't built to sort of track fan out. They don't care how many times you use a variable. That's not something a, a compiler really cares about that much. All right, now the, the tools that are available for automatic differentiation, the high performance tools that you can go, you go to the AD conference and ask what are the highest performance tools, so things like top and odd, they're, written as preprocessors. So um, they're hard to apply in a nested fashion. They have an a, a API where you annotate your program to tell it what derivatives you want. You run it through this preprocessor, you get back a bigger computer program that has some extra functions in it, and then you have to call those extra functions. So if you want to, say, use a gradient method for optimization, you have to do this staged computation first and then call the optimizer. And the optimizer has to know that it's good. You have to know when you call the optimizer that the optimizer needs the gradient. And you have to get, get that all arranged. So that, we call that a caller derives API. And that really impedes modularity, because if you go change your optimizer to not use a gradient method, or say to use a second order method, you know, I don't know, stochastic Newton's method, we know how to do that now. It's amazing, right? Um, then, well, you have to go change all the code. And so that, 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 that's brittle. So it's kind of like, like building it like this, right? It's kind of an old-fashioned way of doing it, but, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not dissing it, right? Like, there's a reason that people did it that way. 
But to get a more fluid kind of modern style, you want nesting to work. So let me um, just sort of quickly show some of the kind of things we can do if we have nesting available. Whoops. Skip forwards. Oh. <coughs> There's all kinds of things that, that you'd like to do, do nesting for. So um, there's an objective function that has a derivative inside of it. It's nice to be able to optimize things where you know you have smoothness criteria or other criteria that involve uh, derivatives in your objective function. Multi-level optimization. Uh, multiple a interacting agents where one agent has a model of another agent. Hyperparameter optimization. Um, doing robustness or sensitivity kinds of computations and maybe even optimizing for them. Those all involve nesting. To get nesting to work requires all kinds of really hairy work that, that would require many hours to talk about, so I'm not going to give any details now except to say that it involves a kind of delicate dance between making, putting powerful enough mechanisms into your formalism to allow you to do that, but in order to get nesting to work, those mechanisms themselves, you have to be able to take their derivatives. So it's like this really difficult process of putting in mechanisms that are powerful enough to, 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 to do the business, but not so powerful that you can't do the business on them. So getting, getting, closing that circle is really quite difficult. So there are fielded systems that are sort of, well, maybe production quality, but first class automatic differentiation, meaning that you have runtime operators, or at least what looks to the programmer like runtime operators. So either they're very fast, and Jeff Siskin will be talking about one of those later, later, later today. And Schlager was talking, it's really an amazing bit of work. Um, and she, it, but that really shows the, the kind of headroom that, that there is for, for, this, for software tools. Or usable but slow. Because that system is a um, uh, uh, research prototype. Oops. So if you want to see the benchmark of that research prototype, you should come to Jeff Siskin's talk. And now let me close up by saying, um, one system that we have kind of feel that is one that um, Ganesh, who's right there, uh, has, has, has built. And um, it, 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 um, it's built on F Sharp, which is available on, on um, both Windows and, and, and Linux. And it's a .NET citizen. It's, it's a reasonable system. You can go off and use it and play with doing this kind of nesting stuff. And it works okay. It, 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 it's, not, it's not super high performance, but you, it's pretty expressive. Um, so let me just give some examples of. I'm just. Gonna, okay, let me give some examples of the sorts of things that you can express with systems of, of, of this skill. So here's. Um, this is kind of pseudo code, but it's not very pseudo. So here's back propagation, right? This, that you have a first class gradient number. This is supposed to be code, okay? This isn't like fancy method in blackboard. This is supposed to be basically what you write on, in your, on your computer, in your Unicode, right? So. This is a lambda expression. This is a function that goes from, from W to, to, um, right to, right to, to, some, to some error function. Um, okay. And here's Hessian vector product. This is a directional derivative, so that's a forward mode transform. And um, that's a reverse mode transform, so this is forward on reverse. And you get a Hessian vector product. So, right, like, that, that's my PhD thesis, right? <laughs> Down to one line. Okay. Um, so this is RGRL, which is, um, people are getting very interested in this again. Um, so this is a, a forward mode, mode transform, and it's, it's basically keeping the, the matrix of sensitivities forward through your computation as it, as it runs forward in time, and that's why this map is like running your computation forward in time. Here's tangent prop, right? That's an uh, I think underappreciated technique because it uh, has um, a, a lot of potential in our, in our modern systems to try to enforce invariances in a, in a very sort of gentle but powerful way. Um, here's some kind of uh, hyperparameter optimization. And let me talk about just one more thing, and then I'll close up, which is, here's a method of temporal differences. Now, I just taught a machine learning course this fall. There's two more lectures left. And um, when I talk about the method of temporal differences, you get some kind of, you, you get your error function, and it's got these terms in it, which is the difference between the output of the network at time t and the output of time t plus one, and you try to minimize this difference. And then starts the hand waving, right? Because you want to say, well, we're going to try to minimize, the method of temporal differences minimizes this. So you want to take the gradient of this with respect to w, right? 
that's the natural thing to do. And so you write that and say, oh, well, the gradient of d with respect to w is a function of w. Okay. So there's, there's the gradient you want. I mean, write this down. And so with this gradient up here, it goes inside of this e and like starts crunching inward, you get this term here, right? Which is the gradient of the mapping from w to the difference between the output of the output time t and the output of the output time t plus 1, you know, quantity um, squared, um, at that point w. So you get that gradient. Is that right? No, that's wrong. The method of temporal differences, you're not trying, you try to make this more like that, but you don't try to make that more like this, right? It's forward, not backward. And in, it's really hard to write that unless you have some kind of first class operator. So with the first class operator, it's really easy to write that. You say, okay. We'll let v equal w in the gradient of this function. So v is not the variable of differentiation because that's this variable, only this variable here. And so that only goes to there. And this v is frozen out of that. But you can't do that if you don't have like lambda expression where you can talk about binding variables, which are bound in which context, stuff like that. So this, when you have formalisms like this, you can actually talk about this. And you can get it right like, automatically. Instead of just having to wave your hands about this, as I had the unfortunate experience of doing it every single time I teach machine learning, you say, we take the gradient, except like skip this term, right? All right, let me give you a few hooks into the literature. If you've never heard of checkpoint reverse, that's if, if, if you're using up too much memory in um, your reverse mode computations, checkpoint reverse is a really good way of using a little bit of extra computation to bail you out of a lot of storage. That, that, I think, has been imported into this community. Like, people are implementing that in TensorFlow now and stuff like that. But have you heard of cross-country optimization? There's a lot of techniques in the AD community that have yet to be mined for, for machine learning. Did you know that taking the nth derivative, um, so the nth partial derivative of this thing, is for f, a simple polynomial is sharp p complete. That tells you that there's certain things that you're not going to have much luck approximating. Kind of useful result, right? Because if you can do well at approximating each one of these derivatives, then your whole derivative, your whole thing here, you'd have a good approximation algorithm for sharp p complete problems. That's probably not going to happen, right? Or if it does, it's not going to be some simple approximation method out here. It's going to be like really, really, really fancy theory. And here's some tools that might be of interest. They might not be too, they might not be applicable to your problems, but the techniques they use are things that people implementing stuff in this community should know about. So tapenade is um, in a, a very aggressive production quality Fortran-based system that has pioneered a whole bunch of interesting techniques um, and done so in a fashion which is for pretty, you know, it's, it, it's, it's Fortran, but it's, you know, it's, it's Fortran, right? So it's, it's not static, but it's not completely dynamic. So the, the setting that they're in is pretty close to the setting that I think people in this community are often interested in. And here's some like frontier issues that I think um, are things that AD hasn't really looked at yet, um, like pre-allocating data structures or complicated, um, more complicated primitives that you're taking derivatives of. I think an AD-enabled JIT compiler would be an amazing thing, and nobody has thought it was really important on anything like that. Um, uh, convergent loops, people know how to take their derivatives. We know in this community, too, but not automatically. Uh, I mean, we know how to write down the rules and stuff, but to, to really use it in anger requires extra machinery that we don't have. How to efficiently have your gradient operator go inside of sums, which is now done in a sort of ad hoc Daniel way. Right. And then for stochastic gradient, this is the important thing. Right. So that's that's why the stochastic part of stochastic gradient has to be done manually now. And the last point I want to make is an extremely important one. So if you're going to remember two things, one is like that key to forward automatic differentiation, and the other is this: that approximation and taking derivatives don't commute. So if you're good at um, do automatic differentiation, if if the function that you've implemented is if you've done approximations on the way, then this gradient is taking the gradient of your approximate function, which may be kind of wrongish. You're probably better off doing the gradient up, do, do, doing the derivatives up here, and then approximating, right? So this is the source of a lot of little subtle errors, because as your approximations get more aggressive and more, more interesting, often the, the divergence between this path and this path gets bigger. Okay. Um, thank you.
So the, the question is, if I, if I understand you correctly, which of these are, are things that are just my like lunatic ravings versus ones that the, the community is actually kind of aware of and attacking as a, as a community? Is that a fair restatement? <laughs> um, I sort of intended these all as my own personal lunatic ravings. I see. Well, okay, these are all things that the AD community has not solved. So these, these are things that are, that, are, that are tough for existing AD um, systems, but that I think are not completely intractable. Um, so. <laughs> okay, so a JIT compiler means a just-in-time compiler. And, 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 that, and so, so um, well, so, so in, in case somebody does it, right? So um, that's where your, your code's running, and it, it, it might be a little bit slow, and at some point the, the system looks in and says, oh, like, I'm doing this loop many times, I've already done it six times, why don't I compile this loop, you know, like, spend some effort compiling it really well? And it can do that with knowledge of, of all the values of all the live variables. And it knows which ones aren't being changed inside the loop and stuff like that. So there's opportunities for optimization when you do this kind of just-in-time compiling that aren't there when you do you know, batch compiling, right? A stage compiler, a stage system where you, you compile first and, and then and then run. But on the other hand, when you do just in time compiler, you sort of don't expect it to go like take three minutes to compile something. An advantage, I, I think, actually, just in time compilation has more potential in the AD domain than in other domains. One thing is if you have a very fluid runtimey kind of coding style where you really maybe can't tell at compile time what functions are going to have their derivatives taken, then if you're going to have efficiency, you better be taking derivative, like have a just-in-time compiler that notices that you're taking, doing an AD transform of some function that hasn't already been AD transformed and goes and does it right then. Also, when you're doing numeric derivatives, often you know at runtime that certain values are zero, like some derivative is zero, and that's getting multiplied by stuff. And if you're sort of willing to um, say that if something is multiplied by zero, then the product will be zero. So if you may be in some functional context and you're, you're not such an adherent to the, the strictures of IEEE floating point, and right, you're willing to make that, um, make that fast math assumption, then you can maybe eliminate a lot of dead code and reduce the operation count. And that's something that sometimes you can tell something's going to be zero at compile time, but there's certainly a lot of opportunities runtime for noticing when things are zeros and cutting off dead code and, and strength reduction and things like that. So I don't know if that answers your, your, your question. Yeah, so there's an example. So what if, what if there's a lot of control flow? And um, what if, say, there's, um, you know, maybe error checking, that if something's negative, you go down this branch, and positive, you go down that branch, and, and so the, the, the error checking branch isn't really going to happen. And so you, it, 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 when it just time compiler sees it, maybe you can tell it's going to be positive, but you couldn't tell that at compile time. So, so then you could like, reduce your branches in the program, and maybe then go schedule it on a GPU or something. Sure. It's a nice, nice story. Uh, okay. um, so the last question. So let me, let me repeat the question, which is, um, I think, whether you could do AD on, if you consider the approximation operator itself as like a first class operator, right. then can you talk about doing AD of that operator to, right. to, get, to, get, um, to get error bounds? Right. And interestingly, one of the rediscoverers of reverse mode, um, arguably, well, was this guy from Finland, whose name I can't pronounce, but it starts with an L, um, in the early 70s, and that is what he used it for. He used it for deriving error bounds for numeric algorithms. That's how he, he, he got interested in it. Yeah, 
So I think the answer to that is, is um, definitely yes. And more than that, I think if you have first class derivatives in your programming language, so you can write down derivatives, then you can do things like write differential forms, and you can write differential equation solvers that take a differential form and create the atoms internally, like by looking at that differential form and applying it in the right places and stuff like that. And then what you're talking about would be, you know, basically a one liner. And that would be fantastic, yeah. So the question is um, basically about differentiability. Um, right. So the assumption we've made is the, uh, an assumption that basically comes from the synthetic differential geometry, which is a variant of, this, of the differential geometry, which is sort of built on sort of lambda calculus constructive kinds of foundations. And so it's, it's not quite what we want, but, 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 it's, but it's closer to the kind of form foundations we want than conventional differential geometry. And um, what they do there is they make every function differentiable everywhere. So, right. Well, what, one can certainly imagine putting in the type system, like, you know, things where this is differentiable and this is not, and having propagation of, of, of that information. Um, yeah, you, I, I, think, I think the right answer is, since type systems, any proof can be encoded in a sufficiently uh, advanced type system, then yes, proofs of, 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 of like not just differentiability, but also like good approximation properties or whatever, could in principle be encoded into type systems. And the question is whether that would be something that would be, when all is said and done, would be nice enough that programmers would want to use it. And I think that, that, that would be, I, I think that's a very interesting area for research. I, I think that would, that would be re really cool to know whether when you apply some AD operator, whether you're going to get crap or not. And the, the, the type system will tell you whether, whether you're going to get you know, good approximation or not, thing, thing, things like that. Yeah. Um, like any other numerics, you know, when you do addition, you can get crap, right? Because you add small numbers to big numbers. And it's, it, that's, not the pro, that's not the fault of the compiler writer for doing addition wrong. That's like a numeric issue. Similarly, the, I mean, these AD operators, they're also numeric operators. They suffer from all of the kinds of issues of numerics that you have to worry about as a program. Um, and yeah, so tracking those, but I don't know. I mean, they don't, you don't currently track whether like numbers are big or small so that your program can give you a warning when you add a big number to a small number. But maybe that'd be cool. Absolutely, absolutely. And you, you can formulate this stuff with, with like Debian cuts as the, as the type of reels and stuff like that. But um, I think, I guess we're sort of more in the big iron kind of attitude that like, you know, it should just be running on floating point and if it's inaccurate, so it goes. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think it's, it's very interesting to kind of, to kind of look at that. From a theoretical perspective, differentiability is, is, is really interesting. And there's all this stuff from computability of exact reels where, um, any, um, all computable functions are continuous, but not necessarily um, continuously differentiable, right? So, but, but if the differentiation operator is, is computable, then how does that work out? Right, so I, there's, there's definitely some nice theory to be done there with like um, exact reals.